Welcome to the ID10T podcast number 1108. Head on over to ID10T.com to see some uh, fun new and vintage items. We've just uh, added some more vintage shirts in the shop as well as vintage iron-ons, which we have ironed on to vintage t-shirts. So check that out. Um, you can sign up for the email list there or, or you know, follow us on the Instagrams at ID10T. But enough about us. Let's talk about you, the ID10T community events at ID10T.com, like Alonzo, who has done the coolest thing during the pandemic. So Alonzo um, has uh, brought up all these old movies that he liked to watch and watched him with his son. Uh, movies that were that came out before his son was born, and, and now his son is uh, grown. And so they watched these movies together, and they made a podcast about it called The Backlook Cinema Podcast with Zach and Zoe. Uh, and Alonzo said, we've done 12 episodes. We're having a great time together. Uh, our show's available on most podcast apps and at backlookcinema.com. And so I just went to the website to look and it's, I, there's like great movies, you know, like Alonzo and I are in the exact same demographic clearly because it's, uh, Beverly Hills Cop, Romancing the Stone, uh, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, The Hunt for Red October, Con Air, Die Hard 2, Gremlins, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, just like, Basically, just a father and a son watching movies together, and uh, it's and it sounds like just kind of like talking through them. So this is a what a great idea, and what a great thing to do um, uh, with the time during the pandemic to not only revisit some classics, but also make a thing and make a thing while bonding with your son. This is. This is a fantastic thing that you're doing. Thank you so much, Alonzo, for sharing. And uh, events at ID10T.com for anyone else who wants to share the thing that they made. This episode is John Chester, who made an amazing documentary called The Biggest Little Farm, which centers around John and his wife, Molly, who are basically city folk. They live in Santa Monica in a tiny apartment, and they decide, you know, we've had it with the hustle and bustle of city life. We want to go make a farm. We want to make a farm, build a sustainable farm from scratch, live off the land. And so they do. And the documentary is essentially their seven year journey from turning what is basically an unusable pile of dirt into this lush, sustainable farm, this incredible ecosystem that they've built with the help of this, um, amazing man who is essentially like a, a farming Jedi and they do. And it is, you know, it's, first of all, it's beautifully shot. John is a nature documentarian, so it's beautifully shot and the story is incredibly laid out and it's, it's a stunning movie. It's about living sustainably. It's about farming ethically. It's, it's, it's about life and death and nature. Yes, there are things that you could take away that are literally about farming, but But the overall, like, large metaphorical life lessons um, that they learn and you learn from watching their journey are just incredible. Um, It it had been recommended to me by several people. And then when I finally saw it, I was – Lydia and I were just blown away by it. So I had our wonderful podcast bookers uh, reach out to John and he agreed to do the podcast and but we recorded this like let's see we saw the movie like a year and a half ago and then I recorded this podcast literally a calendar year ago a full calendar year as a matter of fact I believe we did this maybe at the middle or end of February I think this I believe was the last in-person podcast that I was able to do before lockdown and we switched everything over to Zoom. And we didn't do it in our normal podcast studio. I actually went to the farm that is the center of the movie, Apricot Lane Farms, and got to see the the landscape. It's, it was incredible and got to meet uh, – there's a pig named Emma who's in the documentary. It's a very famous pig that uh, got to meet Emma and that was really exciting. And so it was just incredible to go. It was incredible to talk to John and um, and also just extrapolate all these incredibly philosophical life things. So even if you have no interest in farming uh, or sustainable farming, you will definitely be able to, I believe, take things away from this podcast. John is incredibly insightful. He's very open. He's very honest. He's very honest about mistakes that he's made through the learning process. He's really an open book. And another reason why I think the documentary is so great. But I do want to give you a couple of heads ups before you listen to the podcast. Number one, there are spoilers. 
We talk about things that happen in the movie in the podcast. If you are not a fan of spoilers, even for like a documentary, and by the way, it's, you, it's still worth the journey, I think, even if you know stuff that happens in the movie. But if you don't want any spoilers, definitely pause this and go watch the documentary. Second thing that I want to make you aware of, you know, there's a lot that happens in the movie. There are triumphant moments, there are happy moments, there are fun, funny moments, and there are sad parts of the movie. They're, they they do lose animals in the process. There is this through line of circle of life, life and death, you know, life leading to death, death begetting life. And while respectfully handled, it still involves animals on the farm. If uh, that is potentially triggering or upsetting to you, then maybe the documentary might not be, you know, it, I mean, it, it, I, you know, it does all come back around in a very existential and a very beautiful tapestry of life kind of way. But if you don't, if you don't like to even get near anything like that, um, then I just wanted to give you uh, fair, I just wanted to give you fair warning um, about that uh, up top. I still think, by the way, that even if you don't feel like uh, you can watch the documentary, I still think the podcast is listenable. Um, and I just uh, cannot thank John enough for doing the podcast. And and by the way, I do, I want to apologize to John and Apricot Lane Farms for holding on to it for a year. When this, ha- when we recorded it, the lockdown happened a couple weeks later. And so I thought, well, I'm going to hang on to it for like a month or so because, you know, one of the things that they do is you can get tours of Apricot Lane Farms. And also they sell at a lot of farmer's markets around California. So I thought, well, there's not, none of that's going on right now. So I'll just wait. And then, in, you know, later in the spring, hopefully things open back up and then I'll release it. And then in the spring, things did not open back up. And then I thought, well, maybe the summer and then the summer things didn't open up. And then in the fall, we were still in lockdown and then holidays, you know. And so as things are starting to open up now. I don't know exactly where they're at with the farm, but if you go to apricotlanefarms.com, you can get information about what they're doing. Uh, maybe you can contact them. Um, if you go to their Instagram, Apricot Lane Farms, you can keep up with them there. And so I do apologize for sitting on it for a year, but I just, I was just waiting, but I just don't want to sit on it anymore uh, because it was such a wonderful episode that I'm, I really just want to put it out there in the world. So thank you again to John uh, for uh, opening up the farm and, and letting us come and, and see it and for being such a phenomenal um, podcast guest and conversationalist. And, uh, and it was, this was very educational and, and a very insightful episode that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, here is the idea. Oh, and by the way, Biggest Little Farm is available on all the, I'm pretty sure it's most, most of, if not all the platforms. If you just search the Biggest Little Farm, uh, you'll find it. Uh, maybe we watch it on Hulu, but I think it's also on Apple. So it's, it's out there. So thank you again uh, for your time. Thank you for listening. It's the ID10T episode number 1108 with John Chester. Initiating ID10T protocol. I've talked about it several times on the podcast because I guess about a month or so ago, my friend Michelle Monaghan came on and she just mentioned it. Oh, have you seen Biggest Little Farm? And I'm like, no, because we were talking about my my wife's family is um, they're largely, I mean, they work in publishing, but they also are ranchers. And she always says like, oh, it'd be so great to just go have a farm someday and she wants goats and she wants, you know, and so Michelle and I were talking about this and she said, well, you have to see biggest little farm. And we watched it last night and we were just riveted. So it was really exciting that you agreed to come on. I'm I'm really happy to, to be here and it's exciting to be um, having uh, farming be talked about uh, in, in the way that it is, uh, especially in the last couple of years. So it's fun to be a part of this. Well, and it, and it's also because I think, and so a couple of things before we get into this, like I, I you, usually if I'm talking to someone about a movie, we kind of don't 
we'll talk about it too much because I don't want to spoil anything, but there's just no, I, like, I have to talk about stuff that happened in sure. it. And so what I would say to people is if, you know, I, this isn't like, you know, this movie is not like an episode of Breaking Bad. Like you, you can have some things spoiled, but if you really don't want to know anything until you see it, then now's your chance to turn this off, go watch the movie, come back. But honestly, I think you could listen because it's the journey of it is the, yeah. st- the story. There's so much unexpected stuff that does happen that even if you give away spoilers, there, there's um, it does not take away from the experience because I think it's one essentially unexpected perspective flip after another. Yes, it is. And what I keep telling people is, even if you don't give a shit about farming, there's so much amazing uh, life metaphor. Because, and this is kind of one of the areas that I want to talk about. So just so people know, you were not, you and Molly were not farmers at all. You lived in Santa Monica, and you were a, you were you shot documentary basically, right? Beautifully, right. by the way. Which is the other reason the the movie works is because you know how to visually tell a story. I mean, it, the footage is stunning. Thank you. And then you, through a series of circumstances, decide, okay, we're just gonna. I mean, that that was obviously there's only so much time in the documentary talking about. But what was really the process from you guys going? Let's just start a farm. Why not? Let's just go do it. I mean, what? How long was that well, process? What went into that? And how did you? How did you make the final decision? Like this, well, we're going to do this. So the deeper, there's a couple of things. Um, one, yes, we didn't have any real experience in farming, so to speak, or to speak of. I did work on two conventionally run, very industrial corn and soy farms as a kid okay. growing up in on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, knew nothing about soil. Factored. The ecosystem and a farm were not things that were connected together. You were battling the ecosystem to get the ecosystem off your farm. Mm-hmm. Um, but we consider ourselves people who lived in nature, yeah. right? So, but I didn't come to this with any real understanding about what it means to bring an ecosystem into the farming equation. Okay. The way we got to this, there's several things. One, Molly was like this really interested in how food grown in a nutrient-dense way and prepared in certain ways that traditional cultures prepared food – ultimately affected an individual's health and vitality. Mm -hmm. Um, So borrowing from all these like traditional understandings of like ferments and um, food selection, um, uh, 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 like uh, what am I trying to say? Um, Ferments. Sorry. I lost my train of thought. That's okay. Like nutrients in the soil or different no, ways that the food is... Yeah, like uh, just a different food pre- preparation techniques that ultimately maximize digestion of the nutrients available and in so the that food. is not putting a bunch of preservatives in things? <laughs> well, it's also, it's also <laughs> sourcing food that has been grown in soil that informs the nutrient profile of the food. Okay. You know, we're eating oranges that are, you know, say 75%... Um, less vitamin C, say, than uh, oranges of the uh, that our grandparents ate. Right. You know, because it's just they're they're not they're not valuing the nutrient mineralization of food the same way they used to. Anyway, so we were interested in food. That was one thing. But we both also were deeply. Um, we were people who everything we did had to have purpose and meaning. Mm-hmm. We're just that's just how we aligned as a couple, and. There was a, a bit of an a, an end to the road of that pursuit in both of our careers, me as a filmmaker and her as a private chef, because there wasn't a real true reconnection to nature in any of the things that we did. And ultimately, what we've found was that you can pursue meaning, you can pursue purpose, but without a reconnection to the life-giving forces of nature, you're not actually having the human experience. Mm-hmm. And... We're like farming kind of rounds that out and farming in a way that is requiring one to actually utilize the forces of an ecosystem and bring them back into the equation not only forces you into a reconnection with nature, but a very vulnerable and humble reconnection to where you are becoming dependent upon the life-giving forces that we thought we controlled. Mm -hmm. And you understand them more uh, deeply. And from all of that, meaning and purpose becomes more profound. Well, and it... That and that I think is also the secret sauce of the movie because as I mean when you guys it's so amazing to we're actually at Apricot Farms now and it's so amazing to see it because when you guys get here it's like fucking sandlot like it doesn't it's a dirt pile it and of of dirt that's like what do you do with this 
Right. I mean, was that and it's like two hundred acres? Well, we didn't know. It. Yeah, it was about two hundred. It was less. We actually added some on, but it was about one hundred and thirty when we started. Um, but it was. We didn't know how bad it was because there were trees sitting on top of this soil that was dead. So the soil was oh. essentially dirt with which was a medium with which to hold the tree up. So when you so when we you couldn't tell at the how farm, bad you guys were like, oh, this is, looks so. Okay. Yeah, there was some grass. Yeah. <laughs> There was some grass, but there was no grass. There was nothing growing under the trees, right? Yeah. That was anything growing next to or under a crop was considered competition. But I saw pastures and there was grass in it. But when you actually walk out, you would notice that there was about 11 to 12 to 14 inch spacing between the pieces of grass, which is the beginning of desertification. Okay. Right? Because now that distance is the er- beginning of the erosion process and the um, destruction of the diversity of soil. Okay. Right, because plants build soil, plants feed soil, plants protect soil. Without plants, all of that starts to die. Right. Right, so it was beginning to happen even in the pastures that were considered, you know, their entire worth was based on having grass in them. But you didn't really know that in the beginning. No, because I didn't understand how to see anything. (laughs) Well, how did you... uh, So that's the whole thing. If you don't know how to see this stuff, you don't even know what's missing. Well, but then then how did... Because I know you had to raise money... To, yeah. buy, to purchase the farm. So how do you convince – how do you go, okay, so we're going to start a farm. Well, are, are, okay, it's, it's unique. Let me just it, – yes. we have a partnership with our investor and they are, you know, they are owners in the, in the property. Yes. And we are partnering in a very unique way. Like most farmers are owned by the bank. Okay. Like right now, it, it's actually interesting. There's – farmers in America right now carry on annual $400 billion worth of debt every year. Oh, my God. Year. Right? That's crazy. Yeah, and that's with a 20 plus billion dollar a year subsidy from the federal government. Wow. And on top of all that, this past year there's been an increase in farmers for farm foreclosures up 24%. Oh my god. And suicide rates, I think you will find, we will find that suicide rates for farmers this year have been higher than they've ever been before. That is that's heartbreaking. So what's the I mean, we're it, talking about a broken system. So the method with which we look at the economics of the entire farming industry have to change because everything that we're doing right now is subsidizing a such not only destructive economically, not only des- destructive spiritually to people's lives. We're talking about environmental destruction. We've calculated $44 billion in topsoil loss every year to the extractive methods of farming that have been designed to be able to grow food as cheaply as possible for you. Well. That's cr- super short sighted. Yes, but but with but you know the the population of our country is more than it's ever been. So and it just seems to go up. Every, but there's not a food shortage. So there doesn't. So so what is the what is the is it is it soil or is it just the soil erosion or like what's the missing piece that's not connecting the farmers with the people who will consume the food. I mean, it, it, we, we pay trillions of dollars in healthcare every year as a, as, a, as a direct relationship to the inferior food product that we eat. Mm-hmm. We've traded the essentially sweet-tasting, high-carbohydrate food for food that used to have high mineralization and flavor. Okay. Right? And those, that would then contain the nutrients to ultimately inform your, the, the best version of your gut microbiome, which is your immune system. Is that, is that because of cheap mass production? It's, yeah. It started back, you know, World War II when there were food shortages, you know, and it was like, you know, from victory gardens to like, all right, now industrial agriculture came in and it's like grow as much of one thing as possible, feed the world, you know, or mm-hmm. feed this nation. Because the na- national security is always directly linked to soil health, <laughs> ironically <laughs> enough, and the ability of a nation to feed its food. So it, basically the cheap food movement, it just it, – it, here's the thing. I have to back up, all right? I got to tell you a little bit of a story Please. of how we got here, all Please. right? So if you take, if you take the, uh, uh, the, you know, X billions a year, say how many billions a year do you think the Earth's been around? I mean just – uh, seven. Okay, we'll just yeah. Everybody has their number, but around five to it, seven. Yeah, it's around five to seven. Yeah. Right, billions of years. If you take that five to seven billions of years that the planet's been alive, and you spread that across a one one calendar year, okay, human Homo sapiens didn't show up on that calendar year. It's like the, the last <laughs> second, <laughs> the last twenty three minutes. Okay, the last twenty three minutes on December thirty first, we show up. Yep. The Industrial Revolution, which lasts, has been since 260 years ago, the Industrial Revolution on that calendar year reflects the last two seconds on December 31st. Mm-hmm. And in that two seconds, we've destroyed a third of the world's topsoil, wiped out 85% of the wetlands, we've deforested 46% of the trees, 
And we've taken carbon numbers from 200, carbon, atmospheric carbon numbers from about 200 parts per million to over 400 parts per million in just two seconds, in just 260 years. But we've done that completely unconscious of the consequences. Right. And the consequences are this. We weren't aware, truly aware, that we were completely reliant upon the finite natural resources of this planet that go away if we don't regenerate them. We thought we were like resource billionaires. Right. We thought it's like takeout. Well, if you need more pizza, you just order for it. There's not another planet that's ever going to deliver food to us. Right. Everything that we have gotten that we know of has come from soil and pass through the soil first. And we're allowing that very valuable resource to leave us. And we have not connected um, our dependency on it to you know our future and our children's future it's the ideology of cancer which is why i don't think humans are cancer because cancer is unconscious of the fact that it eventually kills the host with which it's dependent upon mm -hmm. right humans are no longer unconscious of that and that's what's changing so all of these questions we've been taught to ask like well is regenerative agriculture even financially viable or how are you going to feed the world with that way of farming all these things can be flipped very quickly if you truly understand that that kind of questioning has gotten us to this point because we've become completely ignorant on the most basic, simple forms of our existence. Is it possible to – is it is – it, I mean, obviously it's possible, but, you know, I, I sort of think of it like um – you know, everyone's become so reliant on the in our culture on the internet now. Do, you know, like, is there a point where there's just some sort of apocalyptic event where nature just is like, "Screw you guys, we're starting over," and then you'll then you'll have to learn from previous mistakes? Like, is it is there going to have to be some well, catastrophic I mean, okay, event if, for people if, to if do right this? now? Right now, if I had sixty five cows crammed together on a piece of ground that had no no live soil, it was uh, say like a feedlot. Mm -hmm where there was nothing to process the urine and manure coming out of the backside of the cow, taking it down, breaking it down, and putting it back into the nutrient cycle of uh, the plants beneath it. Yep. And all of a sudden, one of those cows got the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. My point is, is that we're seeing an epidemic right now right. that's based on you know, stocking density of human beings in unhealthy conditions, right? where things are going to be, you're going to experience the monocrop, pest and disease outbreak on farms, we're experiencing that, we're going to experience that with people. That if we don't look at this whole entire thing, is the ecosystem itself is an immune system, and it's based on two things, soil health and biodiversity. And farms play an enormous role in the regeneration or destruction of biodiversity and or the regeneration and destruction of topsoil. That is the pump that actually regulates the entire planet. Mm-hmm. So if I'm spraying my crop of corn that I only grow one type of corn and I spray something to kill the bug that is attacking that corn and in the process I kill all the bees and all the hummingbirds and all the other things around it, those things have a consequential force or a consequential balancing effect to the rest of my sure. ecosystem. But I don't understand that because I don't see it on my farm, but it begins to sort of stitch together as a fabric of destruction. Right. Right. And so we're not seeing how our immune system is tied to our biodiversity. So yeah, I think we're ultimately going to see more plagues. We're going to see these epidemics of disease, both in crop and in humans. And, you know, we've run out of of solutions to try to fight nature and beat it over the head with a hammer. We have to figure out how to work alongside of it and try to understand why the bad things exist. Yeah, because you, in the in the film, you talk about how all the other, and we're in Moore Park, California now, there's a lot of farmland around here, and you said they all, it's, it's sort of like big farm, they focus on one thing, and right. they weren't doing very well at the time, and you had this, what's funny to hear, just to hear you describe it, it's like, this revolutionary idea of creating diversity in this sort of fruit basket model of, of, of trees and different animals that are creating the, the, the ecosystem. And at the time, when you pose this idea, did you talk to other people in the area where they're like, well, good luck with that? Of course. They thought we were, in, they thought we were insane. But let, let me be clear. Like, I didn't know if what we were going to do was going to work. <laughs> All I knew is that it made sense to me because I had been through some health things too with, you know, both Molly and I both where the gut microbiome addressing the issue of, of our gut actually changed my health condition. And then I started to learn how soil and the gut microbiome are the, are the same thing. They operate off the same principles of diversity. And, and an ability to assimilate and process nutrients and convert it into energy and the forces of life. 
And once you start to connect those things, it just starts to make sense. So essentially what I'm saying is that I, the, the, micro, the, the fractal understanding of my stomach was uh, replicated, replicated again as a microcosm of the farm, which is a microcosm of, of the planet. And so that was all I knew. And so when you try to explain that kind of thing to another farmer who's been growing, say, one type of crop, yeah, they're going to look at you like you're crazy, and they should, because it's just not the way they've been taught to see the world. Right. You know, and the, the, I think the only thing we had working to our advantage was our ignorance, was it a, was a <laughs> willingness. Because you didn't know what you couldn't well, do. It was a willingness to come in and yes. see it differently. Yes. Because if I come with a baggage of like, you know, I'm fourth generation farmer and all my grandpoppies and grand, you know, my daddies and grandpoppies are all telling me, look at it this way. Well, then I'm going to always feel shame whenever I deviate from the way to look at the world. Mm hmm. And what I didn't have is anyone shaming me on, look, on not looking <laughs> at it with a more open and accepting view. So, so I was able to discover connections with my wife in the process of this farm because I was open to discovering them because I hadn't already put into my mind that they were not possible. And so the, the gentleman who came in and... Alan York. Alan York, who... It's yeah. so funny because he's almost this like... Ben Kenobi. Of yeah, he's the, he is the Obi-Wan. He's definitely. the Obi-Wan. He yeah. sort of comes in, he's got this ponytail, and he's just like this... And he dresses in linen, just and, like Obi-Wan. Yeah, he <laughs> totally does. Yeah. And he's got these, quote, crazy ideas about how... And so... He was our consultant, our mentor. And he tells you... He's the only one that believed in what we were trying to do. I mean, he's like... He's basically like a land whisperer. Like, he yeah. understood... He understood... And it's funny because he kind of tells you, like, well going to take you i think he may even says like about seven years for this to like really get up and running yeah and the documentary is a period of about seven years yep. and he was seems like he was right and was. so the process of watching you turn this um dirt pile into like the way it's mapped out and watching you the, the life stuff that is fascinating to me that i think will resonate with anybody is we all tell ourselves these stories about how, you know, if it's the if then thing, well, if I get to this point of success, then then I will be happy and then everything will be easy and then my life will be a piece of cake. And what what you find when you watch this movie is that at every phase you like break through another barrier, your lives actually get harder because it's a whole new series. You unlock a whole new series of problems, issues, responsibilities, stresses. So it's like you're constantly cresting this little mountain and then like, oh shit, the sky's, you know, and then it's a whole other series of problems that you have to solve. And it feels like, and obviously, you know, we're watching an hour and a half or whatever over seven, you know, that's seven compressed, years. Compressed, yeah. That's compressed. <clears throat> but did it, did you ever get to celebrate any of the wins along the way? Or was it that sort of immediate, like, yay, ah, shit, oh, God, it's what? It's so true. Like, we're taught to, like, come to this finish line sort of moment where you can quantify your life as either, like, it worked or it didn't. And people say, is it, is it better now? Like, are you still dealing with all those issues? And I'm like, you know what? This is what we learned. It's not actually about – and this is going to sound um, – Maybe this is going to sound a little bit overly idealistic, but it's the absolute truth. It wasn't about winning. It was about seeing it differently and knowing that all of your fear can be flipped as soon as you turn on the, the, the antidote to it, which is curiosity, mm -hmm. and have hope. So it's about curiosity and hope and knowing that if you're willing to be curious about while every, why every bad thing is in your life is, or why, why a bad thing in your life is happening, you have the opportunity – to find within that bad thing the opportunity for a growth and a more beautiful life than you ever could have imagined. And that, I think, is the magic of this story. Why I say, like, even if you don't understand or even care about farming, which I think you should, but if you don't, that's fine. But it's really that's not your, about farming. You're absolutely really right. It's really not about farming. I, it's, it's, a far, it's a film about life, and that's exactly why and it I made it. happens to take place on a farm. Right. And, yeah. and the idea that every time you fight nature or you fight the barriers you get knocked on your ass and so then you have to start asking better questions like like with the coyotes that keep killing everything well okay how okay how can we implement how can we make this a part of the ecosystem and work with it but first why does the coyote exist 
that's the first question. Why does the bad thing even exist? We can try to figure out, we tried all that. Oh, we're going to, how do we stop the coyote, right? How, oh, we shoot the coyote. We put more fences up. We do this, we do that. But first, the most important thing is that why is the coyote even here? Oh, okay. The coyote does a couple of things. The coyote actually eats gophers. That's one of our pests. Mm -hmm. The coyote actually eats rabbits. That's another one of our pests. The coyote actually is a pollinator. It moves pollen through ecosystems as it brushes past one bush to the next. It eats seeds from one plant and cross-pollinates them to another part of a biome. And it's doing all these things that no other animal does just like that coyote. So there's value for the coyote. So it, it suddenly you look at the coyote as like, oh, it's kind of got a role. And if I kill it, I'm probably going to have more rabbits and I'm probably going to have more gophers. And then there's all these other like eco effects that I may not really see. It's like but, spraying the corn. You're yeah. like, you're just killing one thing, yeah, but so you're not solving the... I value the coyote now. So it's a little different. I'm not just trying to stop an annoying pest. I've fallen a little bit in love with this creature <laughs> in, in hopefully not an overly um, um, an, a reckless way. But in our case, I think it got very reckless. I'll leave that up to the viewer. Sure. We, I think we, we went too far and we lost a lot of animals over our trying to understand the coyote, but that was our journey. We were honest about it. But, um, but then you, you suddenly start to see now solving that problem has a purpose and intentfulness behind it that's not, that's not just one-dimensional. And it's just the same with, with Monsanto. Everyone hates Monsanto and Bear. I hate them too. But guess what? We invented them because we wanted our food cheap. And so they think – the people that work for those companies think they're saving the world. They think they're providing a service, and we're trying to fight against them. Mm-hmm. But we don't understand that we're the reason they exist. So we have to create a reason for them not to exist by <laughs> innovating around them. We've turned our innovative brains off. Well, because we want everything solved in a half a second. Like we well, want, exactly. We, we have want no patience for no any of this No patience. We're just like, well, can I just sprinkle something on that and fix it or make it go away? And it's like, no. And you, when, it, when, you, when you see your journey, um, it, it seems like... Time and time again, you learn that lesson until you finally get to a place where you're like, okay, I get it now, you know, and it, but it, but you guys get knocked down yeah. a lot. Well, there's a lot to acceptance, you know, yes. this, to anyone who's in, uh, who's in a, a, a recovering addict, there's a lot to the serenity player. No, me, I, player. I am, I am a, rec I'm a recovering drinker. I well, totally, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you change the things that you, you can and accept the things you cannot change. Well, the acceptance part is hard because it's really hard because we live in a, our, our culture basically. And, and I believe this sort of like evolved out of like this sort of post-war era of like, you know, we, as a culture have suffered a lot we went through a depression we went through a war we went through a you know toxic industrial revolution so now you know we have some more space in our time so let's get comfortable you know and but comfort is also an addiction and we seek it out at any cost now and even when it actually works against us or keeps us from evolving or keeps us from growing because we never want to feel uncomfortable in any given moment instead of just accepting like life is kind of discomfort and just navigating through it. And it's very hard to do You're that. So, it's so right. I, don't you feel like all addiction is um, really almost like a, a s spawned from like a, an ability to connect? Well, it is that. And like it's, a, a I, it's a lot of things, but it's also like what so you, you said, like we, why, why do we have the addiction? There's physiological reasons we have it. There's probably genetic course. reasons we have it. But, 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 it's, but if you find connection, that's what, that's what, a, you know, that's what sure. a provides is like a connection to community. And it's like, it's actually part of the healing process. But I think what we're all seeking is a form of reconnection. So like this, I mean, just go back to something you sure, said earlier. Yeah. You said like, it, we want this here now real quick, fix it, you know, this yeah. real quick fix society. The beauty of life to me comes in the time that it takes to understand these things that ultimately drives a much deeper connection to understanding these things that right. creates a purposefulness and a meaningfulness right. to life. And so that impatience, unfortunately, is the thing that gets in the way of experiencing a more beautiful human existence, which which is part of that is pain and loss and 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 it's not just I feel happy all the time, so I'm, right. I'm going to numb, you know, because it's it, not all right. In the same thing, especially with like with drinking or drugs or sex addiction or work addiction or whatever it is, 
you know, a lot of people when they when they quit drinking, they'll go, "Well, I don't feel better." It's like, no, you you don't yet because now you've removed the obstacle, you've removed the blinders. Now you have to do the work to figure out why. Right now, you can ask those questions. Why are we doing this? Well, let me tell you how a plant works because this is really. Tell me if this like resonates Please. with you. Like how a plant. So we looked at our plants that they were completely dependent. When we got here, they were dependent upon the farmer for everything. Okay, sort of like an addict. They were dependent upon the quick <laughs> fix of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Very basic ingredients, right? Not a very healthy sort of uh, mineral concoction. Just the basics. Right, and everything that they were getting was they were getting from a quick fix from the farmer. They were not having to search for any of those things. Mm-hmm. As soon as we turn the soil system back on, we create all these different. Um, we repopulate essentially the soil with bacteria, microorganisms, and you know different fungi, especially mycorrhizae fungi. Right, which is this fungus that actually develops a relationship with the root of the plant that's now in search of something it needs that it can't get because the farmer's not just giving it to it. Right, the root tip of the plant is actually searching and now having to create this relationship with this fungus that wants something from the plant called carbohydrates, sugar, that the plant makes through the process of photosynthesis. But the plant wants something from the fungus that the fungus can get, and it's called phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And mycorrhizae organisms, or mycorrhizae sort of connects to the root tip, sends out these mycelia sort of strands in search of phosphorus to then feed it back to the root tip of the plant in exchange for sugar. Just by the fact that the plant has to figure out life on itself now, it reaches out for connections to find mutualistic and symbiotic relationships that are beneficial to both sides. And that dependency on others around them creates a community of immunity. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you could talk to the plants, they would probably say, yes, this process of having to find that phosphorus is not an enjoyable process. Right. But, no. it, but the same thing it was, was like, hard. It had to grow new, new, you know. It was uncomfortable. Yeah, but. It's like but, neuroplasticity. It's physically hard to grow absolutely. your brain. You know? and, and, I, and I think that's a, that's a really apt comparison because, you know, especially with addiction, I think m- most addicts would probably agree. I'm not trying to speak for everyone. No. That much like the plant, much like the the plant in the beginning of that story, is that we can have issues um, living and connecting in the world, and so we tend to isolate and just try to numb and just get what we need to just survive, rather than than being a part of the of the system. And I think that's hopefully what sobriety does. That's hopefully what you know, like this sort of ecological sustainable farming does. But it. Uh, you, you, but you have to accept the discomfort as part of it and be okay with it, which I know is hard, but it's like you say in the movie, you, you have to search, you have to risk. The plant has to put some roots out. It has to do some work to find connection, and it may not be received. Right. And, and I think when anybody goes through something bad in life, it's a lot more difficult when you're alone. Totally. And it's really, really hard to be vulnerable to ask for help. Yes, really vulnerable yes especially if you live in a especially if you're if your soil or the people in your life are toxic right exactly. you know and then and so how do you how do you do that it is I the one good thing about the internet is that it does connect people in that way but it's also the acceptance of because our producer katie i said oh do you see the film yet and she goes i'm scared to see it because she loves animals so much she knows that she's going to watch animal like there there's loss and that's very hard it's very hard and you come to that place it, it's it's there was a line in there that completely floored me where you say, you know, it's something to the effect of, and I'm sorry if I'm botching this, the fu- the, the the ecosystem relies on impermanence. It, it's it fueled by it. it's fueled by impermanence, and so we, as sad as it is, we have to accept the decay because without the decay, there's no regenerated life. It just doesn't work. Every part of who you are passed through the soil first. Like you are nothing, we are nothing more than a yellow or a leather bag, not a yellow <laughs> bag, a leather bag yeah. of nutrients, all right, borrowed from the soil. We are, we, are the, we are the makeup of things that used to be woolly mammoths, little cute white kittens, right, right and pieces of fruit. Everything that we are passed through the soil. And, and people oftentimes, so one other way to look at it is like this, because people oftentimes say it's a circle of life, right? Speaking about impermanence and the importance of it. It's not actually a circle. 
in my opinion, it's an eight. And if you look at an eight and as you sort of come from the center cross point of the eight and you come up, that's the birth stage. And as you crest over to the top part of the eight and start to come down back towards the cross point, that's the death stage. Mm -hmm. And now as you're going through the cross stage of life, you're passing into the soil. That's the decomposition stage. And you're coming back around the bottom. You've been fully decomposed or whatever it is, plants, animals have been fully decomposed, comes back up through the next cross section. That's the reanimation stage. That's where everything that was alive before has been broken down, repurposed, and becomes literally the minerals and nutrients that fuel all future life. And as it crosses through this X, you realize now the X factor of our existence is soil. Mm -hmm. It's a pump. It turns everything that was once alive back into something that's now broken apart and becomes fuel and energy for all, fuel, all future life. So we are fueled by impermanence. And until you understand and value impermanence as a law, you can't quantify in your head why loss and end exists. Mm-hmm. But it exists in infinity. And that's why I think a lot of religions have adopted this philosophy that life is forever, that we live on in internal forms. And the truth is we do. I buried a dog from the film, Todd, my favorite dog, who drove this entire journey from the I'm so sorry, Katie. (laughs) (laughs) But you really should watch. And and I buried him next to a, a, a mulberry tree. Because of that relationship with the mycorrhizae fungi and the root of that plant, it's gone through and it's broken down Todd and repurposed Todd into those mulberries. Oh, and when so I eat incredible. that mulberry, I eat Todd. Oh, my God. Ugh. Biologically speaking, that's what it is. And if you, don't, if you turn your head away from your fear over the acceptance of death, you miss this incredible, beautiful process that drives life. Well, and because I think, again... As we've gotten, as we seek comfort, as we seek, you know, we're we're in this sort of stage now of like, um, <laughs> like terminal narcissism, where it's everything. It's me, 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 me. With this sort of fake idea that we're a part of something, right. but the thing that we seem to be largely a part of, you know, the sort of digital culture is not entirely real like it's made up of... we're not really co- reconnected right 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 we're, right, we're right. more connected but less vulnerably connected than ever before in in, in sort of a human way in terms of i mean I, again i'm not shitting on it again as we talked yeah. about before there are people who connect with people that help them through things oh there's definitely their... benefits to it but don't mistake in it for true vulnerable connection like we're having right now well it's, it's also more nerve-wracking to be course. sitting here looking at you and having being asked, then then me talking to you over the internet through email. Of course, I'm, that's all I'm saying. But it's also the difference between like, you know, everything is how we use it. You know, like some people can drink one glass of wine every couple of days and it helps their heart. Other people have to drink ten bottles. It's like the, at the level at which we consume, right? But also the level at which we're conditioned to only focus on ourselves and be so afraid of the impermanence because, well, if I'm not here anymore, like rather than I'm a part of this process, it's a natural process. If if I lived forever, I wouldn't really appreciate everything because nothing would really have a value yeah. if there wasn't impermanence. Like the impermanence is what creates the value. If everything was permanent, then it, it's like you know when you when you when you're young, you don't give a shit about time because you just think you have it forever. And if you're a, a billionaire, you don't really value stuff because you're like, well, it's stuff. I can get more stuff. I don't care. So like true. you don't value you don't value things until they're scarce or until they go yeah. away. So it's, it, it is like, I love that part of the messaging of it because it's the sort of beautiful arc. That's like, that almost justifies or it, at least it gives all the pain a purpose yeah. and not just like we lost our dog or the coyotes ate this, or we lost this animal that we love or all these trees died or, you know, it's like you coming out and just finding a field of dead chickens yeah. Because something got in. Well, even when something does die, I mean, it doesn't make it easier in the loss of the connection to the spirit of that sure. animal or that thing. But I know that it's going back into the ground to to become part of the next forms of life. And that's not fake. That's not, I mean, that's not cartoon stuff. That's real. Right. And when for me, I've become less afraid of death because it seems to have more purpose now as I understand the cycle, the true cycle of life and the magic of that cycle that, that we have on this planet a 10 to 12 inch soil structure that is the alchemizer of death back into life. And that's not something you can say about any other planet that we've discovered to date. 
Right. And we're trying to reinvent that on the moon and Mars with these billionaires who want to go up there and try to colonize these places before they understand how the engine of the very system that gave them life even works. I mean, relatively speaking, to uh, most things that we know about the planet, I think we only know the soil sciences have really only been studied heavily for the last 30 or so years. Right. Right. We only know that a very limited amount about how fungus works in soil. And that's only been since like this uh, late 70s or something like that. And that's really crazy to me that we have this incredible thing right in front of us that explains so much about the life-death process, but we don't really understand why and how it works. And we're trying to go find someplace else to do it better. And also because to most people, they probably just don't think of it as like a flashy, you know, it's it. It relies on patience because the cycle relies on right. patience. And so it's not, it, you know, and to talk about something that's happening underground, yeah. it's like, oh, I can't, or oh, I don't fucking, you know, yeah, right. how do I, uh, and that's how do I connect I, to that? That's why I made the film too, because I felt that too. A lot of times when I would speak with soil scientists, my eyes would roll in the back of my head and they, it's <laughs> most, most soil scientists know that they cannot make something, you know, digestible to the average person of which I am and was right. getting into this. But I realized that there was a way to show the story of soil without really talking about soil and the importance of life and death process through this story of farming that was digestible, that made people, I hope, fall back in love with the interconnectedness of nature, but really understanding it in a four-dimensional way, like really having a visualization of what that interconnectedness looks like. Right. And did... Did, the film came out last year, 2019? May or something like that. came yeah, out May yeah, of last yeah, year? Yeah. And I imagine you are, are, are people asking you to come speak at conferences? Is there, is there more? Have you, have you noticed an uptick in entrance? Are people starting to take notice? I mean, I, I did. I mean, like, I'm, I'm so incredibly uh, enthralled by it um, that, and also, it's, it also is a testament to how we as creatures love a good story. And you could have, you know, if someone very flatly came up and said, sort of like you said with the scientists, well, it's really important because the soil is like, you know, we have to create the life. People go, I don't, what do you, yeah. you know, but you give people an emotional reason, which you did, yeah. and a visual reason, which is, it's gorgeous. Then all of a sudden, like, we're emotionally invested now. We're listening. So or have you found that you're speaking or are companies interested in what you have to say? Yeah, it has happened. And I still am a farmer with my wife and it's been challenging to, to take up, uh, take advantage of these opportunities to go talk, but we've done, I've done a few. Um, and yes, that's happening more, but also what's happening is I'm hearing from other farms who've done this for years, even longer than us say, man, people finally understand what the hell we've been doing out here. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, and I really respect that because, you know, our f methodology is not prescriptive, you know, it's not meant to be prescriptive in how we farm. It's meant to just sort of illuminate some sort of basic truths about what it means to be a regenerative farmer um, and the importance of biodiversity. And farms that are doing those things are now finding it way easier for people to understand the value of the food that they grow. And, you know, it does cost more. And, um, but there's this trade off of ecological impact and health that people right. are starting to value. And when you sort of look, when you look back at the seven years and it seems like a, a lot really happened in those seven years. Um, do you think of it in phases? Do you feel like, Oh, this was that phase. And then we got to this phase. Yeah, like definitely. How do you, how do you so, sort of, if you're mapping out like the, e you know, as like the same way that we sort of map out like epochs in history, like, you know, like, how, how do you kind of map out each so section? the first... All right, so this is funny because Alan told us this is what was going to happen. And Alan, spoiler alert, um, passes away in the film. It's, but when he passes away, I think is still very, very whatever. Uh, and you're left with, like, what, what we're are we, left at a, at what a do we do now? Uh, like we're our, left at the worst time. So the first two years is about, to map it out, the first two years is about the enthusiasm and ideology, and you're full of this excitement and belief and hope and possibility. And then somewhere around years three and four, the smile will leave your face as you realize that all of the things that you're now fighting are because of the ideology. You created all of these problems that were not here because you brought nature back. <laughs> and so you're wondering, why in the hell would anybody ever do this? And just as you're about to give up around year five, you begin to see the return of nature that has a direct effect on the balancing, the rebalancing of these epidemics of pests and disease. 
And then you start to see that increase with, with, with intensity from year five to year seven. And now you're finding that you understand the rhythms of your farm, which are like the rhythms of life, and that there's not really a new problem. It's just sort of the same issue with a different face. Mm -hmm. And you have the lenses with which to view problems now, which make problems seem a whole lot less scary. Right. Because you understand that your greatest strength is your curiosity, and that's what continues to get you through. And by year 10, according to Alan, you wonder why in the hell no one else is doing it like this. Wow. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> but I'm feeling, we're feeling way better than we used to. Uh, that's really funny because it, it does sound like even hearing you describe it, sort of, it just sounds like a relationship. You right. know, you start a new rela- you know, like you start a new relationship. Oh, I didn't mention the couples therapist, and he didn't either. <laughs> and Molly and I got ourselves a hell of a couples therapist because around year three and four, Alan had passed away at the worst time when everything went sideways. Right. Literally, like the day things went wrong, Alan passed away. And Molly and I were fighting over the direction of things. Neither of us had any experience, right, to say we, who was right or who was wrong. So we found ourselves on the brink of like maybe not making it as a couple, and we found a couples therapist, which required the same humility and vulnerability that farming does. Right. And um, it has been an, an incredible parallel exploration into what it's re- what's required to really be not only reconnected to the land, but to be reconnected to your your spouse. Well, yes. Anything that you, I mean, I, I do believe that at a at a base level. We are agricultural creatures, even if we are not all. We are, yes. We're not all like <laughs> soil farmers. We all farm to a degree, and anything that we tend to tends to grow, whether right. that's positive emotions, negative emotions, addictions. If you ignore your relationship, it will wither. Like yeah. whatever you are tending to. Well, if you try to maintain being an individual and not be dependent upon anyone. It will destroy you. And that, I feel like, is <laughs> you, you the can't base grow. of what our culture tells people to do is that, you know, we sort of came out of this era in the early part of our country. It's like, oh, you can be – and we should be we should be individuals. Of course, celebrate individuality. Overly it self-reliant. It can't just yeah. be that. You still have to be an individual, but I think be a part of – you know, you still have to be a part of the world. And, you know, that is an interesting lesson to learn mm-hmm. that – Oh, I was tending to the farm. If I'm not tending to my relationship, that's going to wither. Like, the farm would wither if I didn't pay attention to it. It's really hard to leave here once a week to go see a couples therapist when we got a bunch of, you know, it feels like literally sometimes fires on the farm. Of course. You know, it it feels like, why am I doing this? And, you know... um, I think for men, maybe not all men, but for men, it's more. It feels more like a shameful experience to say that you need help with your relationship. And ultimately, I think to be honest, what, what probably is more present in your mind is that maybe you're the, the I'm the problem, and they're going to figure it out, you know. And unfortunately, <clears throat> unfortunately, our couples therapist, t- you know, was quick to inform me that Molly was ninety percent of it. Okay, no, that's not true. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, but no, but, but you really do learn that it's a two way street, and you're bringing all your baggage of your childhood experiences to the equation right you know just like farming like if i brought all my baggage of like the way a farm should and shouldn't be to this farm i would have never discovered the amazing opportunities to find interconnected you know purpose and right? the other thing you're talking about and that's the same with the relationship yeah absolutely i'm sorry i'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt no. I, I just they're, they're like every time you say something like 10 things pop into my mind i love it you're fantastic i lo- i talk to you all day how well, long this, is this it's, podcast it's great because it <laughs> Because basically what you're talking about, is, I think what you're talking about is being present, right? Yeah. If you bring in baggage, you're living in the past. If you fast forward and catastrophize, you're living in the future. Mm. If, you're not, um, if, you're not paying, if you're paying attention to all of the big ticket stuff, you're kind of not living at that street level and being present. So right. really, it's about you're trying to create a system that allows you to live in this moment of pure presence where you can like once every the infrastructure is built then you can sort of stand in the middle of it and see everything in like bullet time because you're fully present with it and you realize that every situation in your life that you want to thrive you kind of have to do that with or it's so it is it's this weird sort of juggling act yeah so how do you know like what's the trade-off because i'm sure a lot of people are in this situation where they're like i want to focus on my relationship i want to focus on my mental health 
I also have this thing that I'm trying to build that requires an enormous amount of attention. How do I know how to divide my time? Like there's the... There's this farming on the actual farm. There's your relationship farming. There's, you know, your mental health farming. Um, who, how do I operate the meta farm that oversees all of those things and ultimately is you? I only know how to answer it from my own personal experience. And I don't know if that applies to everyone. But for me, I had a childhood where I was not very happy. Mm-hmm. And rather than um, be maybe given the real true connection and um, support that I needed as a child, I turned inward and became a filmmaker at night in my room and focused exclusively on my work and found happiness in that. And while it gifted me with this like trade and a life as a filmmaker, and I feel like I became a better filmmaker because of that challenge, it, it ultimately meant that anytime I was not having success with people, I just turned away from people and focused on my work. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would relate to that as, you know, workaholics tend to find happiness in the level of control and sort of feedback loop happens in the workplace, but not so much in the family situation. And I have found that as I've learned that that's something that I've done and, and I, and I find joy in the connection to my family that I find that there might be the possibility for more balance in my life where work is not literally what I need to survive Mm -hmm. because I, people say that a lot because my survival is based on the dopamine that I'm getting squirting through my brain as I work. I want to feel that same feeling somewhat too with my family connection. Right. So that's been my personal journey. And I got to tell you, I'm nowhere done with that journey, but that's kind of where I am. Well, that's the thing is that it, I don't think that ever <clears throat> ends. I mean, like, no, it, it just, but like, it's something I'm realizing at 48 and maybe it's late or maybe it's early. I don't know, but I'm realizing, wow, that's incredible. I thought that it was so important, uh, to be, that I was a good filmmaker for other reasons, not because it was actually, cause I was at a really hard time connecting with people. Yeah. But, uh, and, and a lot of that too, and, and I've been through that too with work where I sort of felt like, well, I don't have any value unless my career has value, which oh, is, of course, right. which is, crazy because your identity you can't control like, that that's just all about trying to control the external world and trying to cram external things into you to feel whole but that's not yeah <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work that way and so now i'm at this place where i feel like i enjoy work it's fun it's okay to do it it's fine to make money it's all those things are fine but it's also like it doesn't mean everything you know like i'm Beautiful. i find that i'm happy happiest when i'm connecting with friends i'm having experiences i'm somewhere with my wife or we're just hanging out you know like and maybe that comes with age maybe when we're young we don't have the wisdom and experience enough to understand that and so we seek it in artificial ways of course and we have to get you know we have to go through life and kind of get kicked around before we're like oh okay yeah well that's not that's not going to work. It's all, you know, it's like, the point. That's yeah. the pesticide. Like that's the spraying the pesticide on the corn, you know, like how, how do I really be a part of the world and how do I really connect? And so, um, but I think that just comes with, I mean, you couldn't have told me that when I was, you know, t- 10 years ago, 15 years, I wouldn't have understood what you were talking about. Cause I had to, you know, you just have to live life to, totally. to understand that. But I think that's why that's the point of it though. Yeah. Right? That's and, why we're here. And that, that's why I think so many older people seem crazy when they're like, don't, all that stuff. If I could go back, I would spend more time with my kids. I would spend more time. Yeah, exactly. That's what they all, you know, all these older guys will tell me like, man, don't miss this. Don't miss this. And you, you think it's, it's free. There's, they're trying to signal (laughs) from the future. Yeah. They're saying, go back. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That if you only seek value in external things, that it doesn't lead to a place because then there's that sort of constant addiction of like, well, that didn't work. So more, well, that didn't work. So more that didn't work. Right. And then, then you're that plant that can't survive on its own. On its own. It hasn't diversified. That hasn't diversified. (laughs) And it is, and it hasn't become vulnerably dependent upon other things for its existence. The idea of biodiversity is, is, is a necessary part of life. And you see it like, Absolutely. you know, like poor, you, you see it in dog breeds who yep. it's like, Oh, you know, the, the certain dog breeds, they get so inbred that it, it, it like their worst qualities get strengthened. Of course, yeah. They can't breathe. And they like can't the pugs. breathe. They can't survive. <laughs> right. They're too, their upper bodies are, are oh. too heavy. And so like, we, Absolutely true. we see time and time again, why diversity is so important, like diversification of genes, diversification of environment, you know, yes. and, and so it's interesting just the, like the idea of diversity, you know, we talk about it in the entertainment business, we talk about it in our world, like how important it is 
to be diverse. And, and your film is basically like, it, not only was it important for our farm to be diverse, but it is necessary and vital right. for the world to adopt a diversification uh, mentality. Absolutely. I think it's ultimately what makes, like, look at New York City. I feel like New York City has this because it's forced to live within that diversity that it sees the power and beauty and culture, cultural differences. Right. And from that, all this amazing art is born. Right. All this creation and innovation from business and art is born from that. Right. There are not a lot of really great artists and innovators and thinkers in the cornfields that I was growing up in. <laughs> it's all pretty much a bunch of blue eyed white guys. Well, and, and it's also about like cul de sacs, too. Like, if you, if you, and, and also, I think this is why it's really important to not just surround yourself with your own ideas all the time because anytime you do that you are you basically paint yourself into this cul-de-sac and you're not being challenged you're not growing of you're course, not seeing yeah. and you know like i grew up in the south and i've talked to people who are like well i don't ever need to leave why do i need to leave home and it's like well you should travel well, i don't need to travel you know it's like but you do because that's how you understand and appreciate the world as a whole and you realize that you know, we are not everything and our own ideas are not everything and why it's important to cross pollinate and to, even if you don't necessarily agree with all of the stuff that you're seeing, at least you can get an understanding and you're part of the human experience. And it is that these, these, all of these ideas are why I think it's important for people to see this movie because there's like, there's like an, a near infinite number of life lessons that, that, that bloom out of it. And I think the beauty of it is that so many people could watch it and take a completely different idea away. And at the core, it's just this, it is a complex, it's a complex, but just the simplest idea of just, you know, creating this biodiverse ecosystem and, 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 the process and preserving it. it. And let me just, can I say two things to Please. make sure we don't leave this off? But you know, a lot of times I think we feel, people feel a tremendous amount of guilt and they want to do something. They, they get inspired. They see the movie. Maybe they can't go out and become a farmer. They're like, what can I do? How can I be a part of like actually regenerating the world and making it a healthier place? And I'd say, and then oftentimes they look at what method of your agriculture should be applied to every other farm around the world. And I would say that's not the way to look at it because there are only two things within this story that can be applied to any place in the, on the planet and should be if we want to see a healthier planet become a part of our future. And that is every decision we make about farming should be looked through the lens of how it will regenerate biodiversity and how it will, rege will regenerate healthy topsoil. And then that begins to inform the methods you're allowed to or decide to use because you can, very, you can very easily see how methods of agriculture will destroy one and or both of those two things. Mm -hmm. And then um, the way to look at your own personal sort of contribution to this would be I am a user of food. And what I do with the food that I waste is very important because it is a finite resource. And so composting, if you live in the city – Composting, be a part of composting programs, compost in your backyard if you can, advocate for government policies around supporting um, composting in cities, not throwing these finite nutrients into landfills. Where they don't the, serve anything. Yeah, while we're trying to figure out the bigger problems of fossil fuels and what are the alternative forms of, of energy. Literally people saying like, well, I'm not going to drive my car anymore. I'm going to ride my bike. They all do that for like five years and then they're driving cars again. And I don't blame them. It's impossible. We haven't figured out the big question on where we're going to get the energy to sort of drive around and move people. But what we can do, what, what is right in front of us, is that we continue to throw away these nutrients in the landfills. And so composting is something that this generation should do while the next generation discovers how to use cold fusion or zero point energy or some other alternative fuel source that'll literally wipe out the problem like New York had, I don't know, 100 years ago when they thought they were going to be buried in horse manure and horse piss because there was no such thing as a car and everybody had horses. Oh. And all of a sudden someone invented the combustible engine and that problem was gone overnight. You look at old pictures of New York from <laughs> right? like the turn of the century and it's crazy. You see kids playing near horse carcasses like horses would just die in the street it, and they would you, just fucking leave them that's there. That's exactly it. And it was buried. There were several feet of manure. It was a major problem. They're like, the world's going to end. And then someone invented the combustion, right? Ford or whoever right. it was. And then overnight, the problem was solved. That's what it's going to take to solve the problem. And of with course, it caused a new problem. <laughs> right, it did. Right, exactly. It caused a new problem. Every solution, unfortunately, creates a new problem. But that is the. But I think the acceptance of 
no solution is final. You know, like no solution fixes everything. Right. And if you can accept that, then yes. I think you can live a happier and healthier life because you just know like, yeah, every solution creates is just there's going to be new. But there'll be new and innovative problems. Right. But then, you know. Absolutely right. It's so true. But like there is so- something is on the horizon for us. But we can't see it. And if you're in your apartment in New York City, you're probably not the one that's going to invent it. If it's like not your job in the world to do that, or your passion, but you can at least not throw your 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 food waste in the dump. And so, what do you do with the compost? Like once you once you start composting and you get the well, if you're the if you're someone soil. who has a gar if you're someone who has a garden or a porch garden and you can buy a little composting unit that you can do yourself that does require some you know um, a, a inspiration. Like mm-hmm. you need to want to do that. Or you could look at what your local community is um, doing to support you contributing your compost waste to other roadside cans or a compost drop-off spot um, that gets then used by community gardens or literally gets exported out of the city back to farms to be the finite natural resource and fertilization needs of farms. I'm absolutely going to do this. You know, we... Um, There's a huge organization in, in LA called Kiss the Ground that does a lot with community composting and a lot of teaching around different ways. And there's so Katie's Kiss the Ground, <laughs> yeah, really great organization, and they've got a lot of online videos to sort of teach you about the importance of soil. Um, but that's really what this generation should be about because I think we get very caught up in trying to solve these massive issues that neither you or I have the ability to solve, but our greatest contribution is what we do or don't throw away every single day. And I also think people, you know, again, because we want, we want to have big solutions that are immediate. Each person feels like, well, I'm not significant enough to cause any change. And I would argue that, you know, if we accept the idea of incremental change, you know, like even just doing a little piece of it is yeah. is worth it. It has to be I, I, whatever you do. It has to it has to um, trigger dopamine squirting in your brain. It will not happen. <laughs> I'm serious. So you have like, to, you have you, to find reasons why if it's you're important. if it makes you happier to ride your bike to work every day than it does to compost. You be the one that rides your bike every work right. to work every day. If it makes you happier to pick up a piece of track, like notice the euphoria. Mm-hmm. Follow the path of euphoria and curiosity, and you will build a life of integrated purpose on this planet. Yes, because ultimately, I believe that's enough. And people don't they beat themselves up. Well, I feel good about this, but is it enough? No, it's enough if you feel good about it and it's contributing in a positive way, which is great. Start there, <laughs> which, is, which is great because that fights against the idea of uh, you know the sort of resolution syndrome which, of course, everyone just went through with the new year, where it's like, oh, my God, first of the year, I'm going to eat healthy seven days a week. I'm going to go to the gym five times a week. I'm going to do this. And people set these crazy, unrealistic goals where they think, I'm going ch- to upend my entire life. And you're setting yourself up for failure because right. you'll try it for a week. It's, you're miserable. Right. And then you fuck, go, fuck this. I don't right. want to do this anymore. But if you accept the idea of like little bits at a time... Oh, okay. I can I can make one change in my yeah. life. I can I can compost, or I can do I can ride a bike, or I can do this, or I can. And also asking the right questions and being a part. I think we are all meant to contribute. I think yeah. it's how we survived as a species yeah. is that we are we are genetically programmed to need to contribute to one another, which is why wiser people always say like. Donate your time. Do something for other people. And every time you do, you feel good. Because you're connecting. Because you're connecting and you're getting outside yourself. So even if that's the reason, you know, like that's a good enough reason. I had a, where the podcast studio is, um, there's a a friend of mine came in and he is also an earth whisperer. He's an actor. His name's Logan Huffman. He's like the greatest guy in the world. He's from Indiana. He's a young guy. He's in his 30s. And... But he just he just knows how the soil works, and he built this vegetable garden and literally like built the tools to make he's a guy's like, "Oh, I whittled this down, I put a leather strap on here, and I turned it into a hoe like he he like knew there was an Amish community somewhere in his orbit, yeah. and so he understood, and he built this incredible vegetable garden, and then his wife started working out of town, and so he went with her and I didn't know what it just went. It basically all these veg, incredible vegetables grew and corn, all this amazing stuff. And it basically just became a snack bar for all of the local fauna. And so at first I was like, what am I going to do? I, that's why I connected immediately with your, th- when you're in your first couple of years, I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? I just created a cafeteria for like gophers and the deer and coyotes. And there's a bobcat and it just, they fucking ate everything. And at a certain point I was like, well, you know what? I guess I made their lives better for like right. a couple of weeks. But if you were dependent upon that and you were a vegan, yes, 
and you were dependent upon that and you weren't willing to buy any food from any any store. Right. And this is nothing. I have vegans that work on the farm and yeah. Molly was a vegetarian for 15 years. But it is interesting that if you were dependent upon that garden for your food yeah. and you're saying all these animals are eating it. Yeah. What are you gonna do? <laughs> just because I've not go to yet, real food not, daily. But I think it's something to be careful. If you are, if you, and, and I don't know if you may be. If you, that's fine, and, and I don't mean any. This is something we should talk about. Right. But I get this question a lot. Like, um, how do you? How are you able to do this? Um, and and you know, actually eat animals. And I'll just bring the question up because some of your listeners may be even thinking it. And I'm like, well, I I am definitely not for. Um, uh, CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, and the inhumane treatment of animals. And I think we've priced meat so cheap that farmers very uh, easily excuse in their mind the inhumane treatment of animals as the way to develop cheap food for people to eat. And that's inexcusable. But I do see a very biological, important, connected need to having animal input and animals be a part of the process of building healthy ecosystems and soil. And they should be a far part of the farming process, or you are required to use synthetically derived chemical fertilizers, right? Which are also very bad and damaging for the climate, especially nitrogen, which oxidizes into the atmosphere as, as uh, uh, um, nitrous oxide, right? And is equally bad, and maybe even arguably worse than carbon, right? And even methane, and all these other things. But having a natural cycle living in amongst animals is very important. So you have to understand that if you're vegan. You have to understand how soil works before you point fingers too prematurely. The other thing to understand is that for me to grow avocados and um, apricots and all these other vegetables requires me on this farm, and I'll admit something that no other farm will admit, requires me to kill thirty-five to 50,000 gophers a year, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of ground squirrels, and then inadvertently, accidentally, even spraying biologically appropriate organic sprays, I kill bees by accident, hummingbirds, ladybugs. Life is being destroyed so that you can eat. Mm -hmm. We all have blood on our hands. So be very, very careful to point very simplistically that there is a right and a wrong because that's not how nature works. It's all based on one thing, consequences. And to understand consequences, you need time. You need to understand how what you do affects your life and other lives over time. Consequences lead you to a more truthful understanding, but maybe not right or wrong. Right. So as we get into this debate, regardless of your eating choices, and I believe we need vegans, we need vegetarians, and we need meat eaters, but we need them to be conscious of the consequences of their action and be careful not to single out any one or other as right or wrong because polarization – is exactly what, what has gotten us to this point. And we need people who are less about confrontation and more about innovation. And polarization of ideals creates confrontation because we think that's the only way to fight it. But right now, what we need to do is come together around innovation. And have conversation. And have conversation. Well, that's the thing is that we, we do um, – we are able to create these, uh, these rabbit holes um, online that just surround our own ideas – and any and and we're sort of fed algorithmically like hey you're right you're right you're right you're right because it's engaging right and we are we are te at least it, and i don't believe the internet represents everything i i really do believe that in real life people do have conversations and they talk it just it doesn't seem as represented on online sometimes but we are surrounded by our own ideas and so anyone who does not 100% align with that because we're able to carve these places online that 100% agree with yeah. us. If, if someone even 98% agrees with us, that 2% is like, you dangerous. know what? Fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you for not agreeing with me, you yeah. piece of shit. How algorithms, fucking algorithms even in Netflix develop um, an understanding of your taste and basically create a dashboard viewing experience that pertains specific to your world so that if you were not aware of it, you would think that the rest of the world sees and thinks the way you do. Absolutely. And the reality is, is that advertising and everything else has been developed the same way, right? Yeah. So like we are in a mistakenly thinking that everybody should think like us because we have all this supported entertainment data to say that we're right. It is it so is so dangerous. It is yes because it is it is killing um intellectual diversity. Of course. It, yeah. it, because it's cutting us off from each other and it's making us all intolerant to people who don't 100% align with our ideas. And it's across all sectors, like even entertainment, you know, it's like someone sees a trailer for a movie and they kind of don't like it. So they're like, fuck this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I want to kill this movie. And yeah. it's like, what the fuck? You haven't even seen it yet. You know, like, yeah. and why can't it be for other people to enjoy? You it's, don't have to like everything. It's so hard for me to read the, when someone is critical of the film 
And my wife was, why do you do that? And I'm like, I know it's so painful, but I really do. After I get mad and I, I write the artificial email to them right? and where I say a bunch of horrible things because I'm hurt, yeah. I then start to realize their perspective and how they may be asking or assuming something about me or my intent that others may share. And that's my opportunity as a storyteller to be out in front of that to actually give them an opportunity and a way in that maybe I didn't see there needed to be a door for. Well, and, and that's the way I made the film. I really made it not attempting to polarize any belief system about climate or farming methodology. I don't point the finger at industrial ag. I don't point the finger at climate deniers or climate believers. I really just threaded a needle through the important things that most people weren't able to see. No one can take away from you your experience. Like, you are telling your experience. Right. This is what I experienced. Right. I'm not saying the world should believe it. I'm and not saying the world should do it. This you don't have happened. to like it, but <laughs> no, this is what so happens. True. And this is what we learned. And when, you, when people come at you, you either have the choice to just ignore it and go, well, I did what I did. You don't have to like it. Not everything has to be for everyone. Or like you said, it's an opportunity to go, you know what? Maybe instead of like writing that toxic email back, how fucking dare you, where your defense shields go up. <laughs> right. It's the opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to talk to this person, see if we can understand each other. And at least, at, if, if, the, if the only result is that we still come away not agreeing with one another, we have the satisfaction of knowing that we uh, communicated in a civil way and connected even in our Because that's where innovation lies. Innovation lies at that. Like I, uh, Gene Bauer came out, who's like the head of uh, Farm Sanctuary, and he came up to me after watching the movie and he said – I'm really fascinated to understand how soil works because I don't think I had the full picture. And I'm like, that's a pretty big deal for him to say That's that. curiosity. That's the and curiosity willing, thing you were talking and about. And I'm like, absolutely. Come on out. And we had an incredible experience. You know, I wasn't looking to change him. He wasn't looking to change me. But we actually, amongst that conversation, developed some real innovative ways, and I can't remember the specifics now, around thinking about these issues. And that's that's be- that to me st- stands out as one of the great moments of my experience after this film is being able to come into alignment with people who used to just write like me hate letters, not really knowing my intent or who I was or how I saw the world, and and I think that's that's the stuff that I remember. That's the stuff that I'll go to my deathbed with. Yeah, and also it's the way that we evolve and it's the way that we move forward. Right. The exchange of ideas. If we are just inbreeding our own ideas yeah it we're only going to strengthen we were we you know like we'll strengthen some good stuff but we'll strengthen a lot of bad stuff too and right. then we won't be as open and you know I, I i hope that what people the other thing people take away from this is that sort of like let's start the conversation because when someone does come at you in a harsh way number one the internet, the, you know, comments, social media, whatever, have basically just become an extension of our emotional brain. It's like the second you have an impulse, it becomes permanent text. Yeah. Or, you know, like not permanent, permanent. Right. But, but basically you're cementing well, it. It's, very, you know? it's dangerous. And, and it's dangerous. And yeah. so, but if you can sort of step back from that and go, okay, this person, their brain fired and they immediately wrote this, maybe there's something else going on. Sometimes when you talk to people and, and then they open up, then their defenses come down and they go, you know what, I was just having a weird day. Yeah. Um, or... You know, I had this experience that sort of this triggered that and I felt weird and, you know, but now that we've talked about it, I feel a lot better. You know, and of course, yeah. there are going to be some people who are just chaotic yeah. evil. They're just going to want to fuck up your life and your day because that's well, just... Well, the impulsiveness is the, t- is the most terrible part of, I think, the internet because you can't take it back once it's printed in that way. It's sort of like, you know, yeah. it's sort of like the fire that kind of frames the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've been... Fortunately, you've been very you've been very lucky here. But. Speaking of fires, we've actually had a, a really bad start to the fire season, and then it we got rain and it ended. But we've actually had some of the worst fires even closer to us this year than even the ones in the film. And while we were making the film, editing the film, um, that's when that fire happened. So oh we were literally gosh. evacuating the barn with the drives because we edited the f- film here, and while at the same time moving animals around. But um, that's a new part of life. Like um, we have a Nomex jumpsuits for the guys now, for myself and the others when we're out trying to move animals in case we get caught in a basically a wall fire. Oh my gosh! And we have invested in a wildlife fire truck, you know, and it's a new reality um, that's really you know, quite scary. Like the, people say, what's the biggest difference in the last like eight years? And I would say the wind speeds. The dryness, yes, the drought, we all know about, but the wind speeds used to be 30 to 50 miles an hour during those events. And then in the last two years, they've been 
60 to 80 miles an hour. Oh my where God. you have sustained winds for 60 to 80 miles an hour for like 12 hour periods. And like you put fire on that, it's a blowtorch. I don't care how good of a farmer you are and how much moisture is in your soil, it's eventually going to burn through, you know, this is an overstatement, but concrete. It's going to burn through stuff. So it is a little different. And am I still hopeful? Yeah, I just see it as a, it's a symptom of imbalance. And we as the human stores, if we've done this much destruction over the last 260 years without consciousness, look what two incredibly naive and still naive people, John and Molly, did with seven years with just a consciousness for the effects that we have on the planet. In seven years, we returned a farm to better than the one it was that took 45 years of extractive farming to destroy. And I think the human species has far more powerful than it ever could imagine just by being conscious of its existence and its consequences to nature. And I think we're going to reverse this problem in a far shorter period of time than it took us to destroy. Which is so beautiful and hopeful. It's true. And it's, a, it's a fact. It's whether or not we want to it, do Whether it. or not we want to, yeah. to put in the time because the... Even well, we could always hear- just move to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> even just hearing it in that context of like 45 years to destroy it and seven years to turn it into this... Better than what it was. Better than what it was. And, and let's it- argue... Let me say this. Yeah. And we shouldn't even be farming here. <laughs> nor should LA be in the... De- like practically the desert. Right? Yeah. It's called Chaparral, but it's like the desert. We shouldn't be living here, let alone farming here. But now that we are, how do we do it in a regenerative way? And when you are not solely focused on yourself as an individual like and my needs are always first kind of a thing you sort of look at you when you embrace the impermanence i think and you say you know what because one what one, one point of view is like well we're all gonna die someday so why fucking do anything you know yeah, but you might come back and you might come back but the right. other side is like in, in various forms <laughs> wouldn't you rather be wouldn't you rather be part of the regenerative process? Like you, the, well, if you have kids, that that notion starts to go away. Oh, it does. <laughs> as soon as you have a kid, you start to realize that this isn't about me. It's about leaving him something better than what I had, and that does change. And I get how some people can feel very selfish. Well, I'm die. Who cares? But when you have a kid and you look in the eyes of that kid, you're like, man, really? You're gonna leave them with something worse than you started with? That's and, not fair. And also, that's just, a moral imperative. Just the idea that. Um, you know that during fire season, everything could go up. Yeah. And then you would have to, you know, make a decision, to, which I assume you would probably start over. Yeah. But rather than... That's what ants do. And I, exactly. And <laughs> rather, than, rather than catastrophizing that and being uh, immobilized by it, hmm. I imagine you go, you know what? We do what we can while we're here. Yeah. When the, maybe it we, doesn't happen. We've survived a lot of problems. Yeah. And if it comes up, we maybe, will figure it out. Yeah, or maybe it's not as bad as we think. Maybe it's not as bad as you think. But yeah. also, because you put yourselves, because you risked... Or maybe and, before we get to that point, we innovate something that gets passed on to one individual. One individual who goes on to change the entire world because of one little thing we inspired in them and the way that we do something. Like, that's what I say people go, well, do you think your film will change the world? I'm like, I have no idea. But I would love to have been the thing that inspired Einstein to think differently or to have the courage to think differently because look at the effect that that one person had. So, like, we have no idea. Like, even this podcast, I don't know how many people listen to it, thousands of people, but there may be one person that hears one thing on this podcast that goes on to change the entire world as we know it. Because you're cross-pollinating ideas. Because we did something good. And that, that is about it's being... It's still worth it, man. That is about being process-oriented instead of result-oriented. Now, yeah. granted, you have a farm and there's, results are important because you, the farm has to... I see know. myself as a small part of it. And I just hope that I'm contributing in a way that's going to have some effect on future generations to be able to add on to the intelligence that we were still trying to collect. You know? And I, I think it's, it's, it's be very defeating to sort of think that it doesn't matter. Right. It does. And I think if you don't have a kid, then look into the eyes of another child and say that to them, that it doesn't matter what I do. Right. It doesn't matter how I leave this earth for you. Like, they have no idea what they're about to face. Well, also, it, we would not have felt cool as kids if someone was like, hey, fuck you, kid. I don't care what yeah. happened. You're like, that feels bad. Yeah. You know, as we're winding this down, first of all, you get, do you give tours? We do. Okay. Yeah. So you get not that not that often. Once a month, and if people are interested, the best thing to do is sign up on our mailing list because okay. 
we have been very overwhelmed. So we don't announce it on social media anymore. We just send it out to a mailing list uh-huh. because literally they crash. It crashes our our little oh, website. Oh, that's really nice. And the chickens are in charge of our website. And they're <laughs> terrible at it. So we so um, we sign up for on our apricotlanefarms dot com, and it's a great way to interact with the farm. But like I say, we don't do them that often. But and we don't do them during fire season. Right. We'll start them back up. I think in March, and yep. so spring and summer, and then uh, fall winter we kind of chill out and then my other couple questions are where um, where is where is all of your stuff available like how does it filter out into the so um farmers markets uh down in santa monica we're like the wednesday market santa monica sunday market we're in calabasas um i know i'm forgetting like two others um um i can't remember the names of them now just lost my train of thought okay. um er, er, we're in Erwans um and other uh sort of artisan type uh, mm-hmm. shops carry our stuff and we also do sell some things online um not mostly not fresh produce but other other things like uh jams and uh, olive oils and things like that and, top or, to and bottom, uh, avocado oils top to bottom can you sort of list off like these are all the things that we grow? Yeah, it's two hundred and fifty. Oh my gosh! Yeah, a lot of stone fruit, avocado, lots of different varieties of avocados instead of just maybe one. Right. Um, we do uh, peaches, plums, nectarines, apples, oranges, um, all different types of citrus, kumquats. Um, then we have a vegetable garden, which is a much smaller operation. Then we have um, eggs. We're known for our eggs. We don't do a lot of them because we focus on quality and the ecological restorative um, effects that chickens can have on land, so we don't overdo it. Um, We sell broilers, um, lamb, um, beef, um, uh, and and some pork, not a lot. Um, That's pretty much that concoction. But the olive oil is something that people can order online. It's great. It has a super high smoke point. People are into that, grilling with oils. Um, And other uh, olive oil is coming out soon. That's pretty much. Yeah, it's and again, when people watch this movie, like the couple of the couple of epiphany moments that I had watching are the the thing about impermanence fueling uh, that it's fueled by impermanence. Yeah, the situation with the coyotes that is heartbreaking for you. And then you figure out how to work with it. And then also how the snail problem gets solved is <laughs> fucking amazing. And those are the moments where you're like, Oh my God, if I can just figure out, you know, instead of like destroying my problems, if I can ask better questions, yeah, who's the coyote the in wise, your life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's somebody who is incredibly good at something, but they're constantly making your ecosystem they're, hell. But there's some quality in them that probably, if directed in the right way, is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Uh, I get that question a lot from people who try to apply this th- way of thinking to businesses. Like, we're snails, trying to figure out who the coyote there is. There are snails our- in your life and there are coyotes in your life, but it's all a part of it. And if you can yeah, figure out how to work it. That is a great it. way to look at life. And then what is the sort of, um, you know, as you are ever learning, as you said, it... Um, what is sort of like the big for you? What was the big, what was the big takeaway? Because it must have you obviously lived through it, but when you watch the film and you see this highlight reel of the seven years of all the big moments, what is your personal takeaway? Like, what do you think besides the sort of literal, like the, you know, the soil is 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 what where the life is? Like, what are what's kind of the the, the philosophical thing that you take away from it? Oh, let me think for a second. I. I th- I've sort of touched on it. Um, I think that, you know, we live in an infinite cycle of, ex- you know, existence in different forms that is based on um, this whole uh, biology of, of, of soil life. And that, um, you know, there's not very simple right or wrong, clear answers to things in our existence, especially that I've learned through the farm, that it really is based on these consequences. And sometimes the consequences don't show um, show you the way until several years beyond what you think is even possible to um, sustain or wait for a, um, an answer. Mm-hmm. And there's something beautiful and comforting in that. Um, and that um, whenever I'm afraid, the antidote, like I said, to that fear is my ability to stay curious. And we are living in a culture where the polarization and anger that's caused from that has us squint our eyes and turn away rather than stay curious about asking questions differently or understanding why things exist. And there's something incredibly freeing about that. 
And I fear less about what's happening with the planet because of my understanding about the infinite possibilities that exist within an ecosystem to help it heal itself. And I, I have a lot of hope from, for future generations because I see how engaged and interested they are in this problem. It makes me feel like, God, what was I doing for the first 25 years of my life? Because <laughs> they're asking questions and are curious about things that make me feel incredibly hopeful and indebted to them. That's, That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I the biggest little farm is we watched it. I think we watched it on Hulu or Amazon, but it, we, it's on everything yeah. now. Hulu, Amazon. Google, I think it's on a- a- Play, Apple, TV. Apple TV. Yeah, yeah, it's everywhere. And I, I, I just I encourage people. It's just one movie. It's not a whole. It's not like a ten part series. It's one movie, it and it's very fast. And <laughs> it, um, I, it's one of my favorite things that I've watched. That's nice. Thank uh, in you very memory. much. So I was really excited. My wife was super excited, and. You know, my wife's someone who, as kind of bringing it back around, you know, when we watch this movie, I was like, you still want to farm? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, because it is like, it's, it's a life, like it's your life yeah. to, make it, to make it work. Um, I did, she wanted a goat. We can't have goats in where we live, but uh, there's a dairy farm in Central California, this wonderful dairy farm. And so they allowed me to basically like buy a goat. And they're going to, when it's born, we're going to go up and name it and they're going to take care of it. They get take exquisite care of these like little Spanish La Mancha goats. And, oh, wow, um, great. and so in a way we do have a goat, you know, but all the time she's like, can we get bees? No, we can't have, because we, we had, um, on a, a structure on our property, there was an infestation of bees and I didn't want to kill them. So I had a beekeeper come out. We take those bees by the way. Shit. The next time that happens, bring, I'm going to give them to you. Yeah. People, um, we, we, buy bees from people who have taken them out of people's attics and, you know, tires and fences and stuff. Well, it, the, what was so amazing is, you know, like we kind of yeah. wrung out the honeycomb and the honey is the best honey I've ever had. And my wife said, well, you know, it's because I have planted and she named off like three or four things. And she's like, you know, that combination, it's sort of like how she's my friend right. Logan, yeah, we have the right. best cherry tomatoes because he planted them with basil. Oh, people and, believe in yeah. There's there's like you know three sister planting, where they think that certain you know planting concoctions kind of create the best sort of the har- flavor har- mix, harmony. The harmony yeah. Maybe yeah, maybe even flavor profiles because they maybe use different nutrients in a way. Or- but I've but I I really every every week I have to talk her out of bees because I'm like it's not as easy as you think it's going to be. No, like someone could just they could keep the bees here and then they could take. Oh, I know, but I don't you know. And so I well I guess this is ultimately my. I also want to be careful about not introducing something into our kind of immediate ecosystem of like in in, in yeah, our some of like, the, it was somebody said, I heard it was somebody famous said that uh, uh, that some of the greatest damage to the environment has been done by people with the best of intentions. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, it's still it's still question and look I'll, I'll put it out there it's still debatable about whether or not. I, I'm I, my wife and I are that those people. Right, right, right. I mean, right only right. time will really tell. Right. Um, I just but, don't want to get stung. Yeah, yeah. You don't get, if it's just about not getting stung. Yeah, maybe yeah, it's just about you, not getting you can, stung. You can in the actually, face. you can actually farm um, stingless bees. I'm, I'm joking. Well, anyway. at least with bees, you know, it's like their little ovipositors like rip out when they sting. But a wasp will just sting you a thousand times. You know, right. like the that's what I said. Like what? Because I I I, sh- I took video of everything of like removing the bees. It was incredible. The beekeeper got stung in the eye, which is like, oh, if he gets stung in the eye, like what chance do I have? But um, but I, I made no bones about it. I'm like, I saved these bees. If they were wasps, I would have rained fire on these motherfuckers. I, I feel the same way about rattlesnakes because I have a five-year-old and sure. I have guardian dogs and I've yeah. lost animals to rattlesnake bites. Yeah. Um, not dogs. They have been bit, but I've lost sheep because um, they don't tell you when they've been bit like sure. a dog does. Right. Um, but yeah, there are some things like that that you know I have not – sometimes I will, we will uh, – grab the rattlesnake and turn them over to someone who uses them to train animals how to be afraid of rattlesnakes. Interesting. They put like a box around their head and then they have this whole method of, of uh, training. Um, but then other times we have to, to kill them. Cause what am I going to do? Just take them and put them on another farmer's land. Right, right, right. You know? Um, so sometimes you have to, yeah, sometimes you have to look at it, you know, the lesser of two just, evils two, here. Two, it just, I just want to throw uh, one term at you. Moon snakes. We send them to the moon. Oh, yeah, moon snakes. We, we let the we let, we let the them snakes go up. Deal. Maybe they go up and test out the It's new, a snake world. The terrestrial sort yeah. of... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. so we give Mars to Elon. The, Elon yeah. gets Mars. The snakes get the moon. Yeah, and see how they work it out. <laughs> well, John, I can't thank you enough. This has been so great. And I got to meet Emma the pig, thank which you. I was very excited yeah. about. Thank you, man. Thank you. I, I really I can't encourage people enough to go watch Biggest Little Farm wherever you can. And... Uh, 
live sustainably, be a part of the world, ask good questions, tend to your soil. And I think, you know, some good... Some and good... stay incredibly curious, stay even curious. when things are different than you feel about stuff, you know? Perfect place to end. The end. Or is it? Or is it just the beginning of a new thing? Who knows? ID 10 scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito.